Well, welcome once again to my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. If explicating a practice exam was helpful, I thought I'd do a, a second one here. So uh, first disclosure, explication, remember, it means we're not really interested in so much the right answer or wrong answers. We're interested in analysis of why right answers are right and why wrong answers are wrong. The technical name for wrong answers are distractors. If you're somebody in the art of psychometrics, the art of testing people. And so we want to do that. Unlike the actual exam, which gives you a balance of easy and difficult questions, uh, I try and here put, you know, high risk areas and some of the more complicated issues. Not all of them are complicated. I try and match the, the test itself, which has uh, recognition test questions. That's flashcard stuff. Uh, I highly recommend uh, if flashcards are underrated. You might want to get a deck of four by six or three by five cards as you're watching these le lectures or you're stuttering and studying and, you know, if you find some good flashcard fodder, which is typically recognition style questions, you should certainly make a flashcard. Uh, flashcards are also great to perhaps get rid of significant others who are bothering you while you're trying to study. You can say, hey, honey, can you run the flashcards with me? You know, I might actually have two sets, one I actually use to study and one I use to get rid of people who are bothering me while I'm studying. Maybe on that one, I have interpolation and, you know, rehypothecation and disintermediation. You know, maybe they'll make it a few minutes uh, before they say, oh, that's enough. So um, if you want to do this as a practice final and, you know, use it to inventory your skills, you can just kill the audio. And as you see here, we have the first couple questions up on the screen and you can pause and come up with your answer and then, uh, you know, resume the audio and uh, you can see how you did in, in terms of getting the right answer. Uh, if you have questions about this, uh, uh, shout out to, uh, uh, those who uh, had a question about the two years versus the three year shelf, the three year was for Wixies. And I thought that was a better example of a question. So I've uh, uh, changed it accordingly. So uh, if you have any feedback, uh, if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, provide the feedback there in the comment box on the YouTube channel. If you're watching this on the uh, subreddit or you want to answer on the subreddit R series seven, you can certainly do so there as well. Um, same if it's just even if you're not wondering what's a test issue. So this is the second explication of a series 725 question uh, practice final. This is called exam two because I did it once and that wasn't called exam one, but you know, just to keep them straight, I, I figured I would do that. All right, so let's get started. When is the X date? X is Latin for without. If I say, do you have an X spouse? That means you're no longer trading uh, with your spouse attached. See when we start here. I'm trying to get these lectures into some kind of a time time boundary. I'm not doing so well on that, but oh well. Anyways, uh, the X date is uh, X is Latin for without, and the X date is one business day prior to the record. So that's D. Very much a test issue. It's the only date that's not set by the board of directors. It's a function of secondary trading. It's a function of the Uniform Practice Code, which standardizes trading within the securities industry. So. Uh, the answer is D, D. Uh, number two, uh, I'm not going to actually put the answers there. On some of these, I'll stop and I'll annotate them and I'll warn you what I'm about to do so, so you can kill the audio again. But uh, I'm not going to actually put an A or circle it or do that because uh, then I have to you know, get the annotation tool out. By the time I do that and put D, then I got to unlock it to scroll. So I'm just not going to do it. So the answer is D is in dog. Anyways, issued less treasury. Issued less treasury C, outstanding, outstanding stock, outstanding stock, that very much is a recognition test question. I can't imagine, you won't get all of them, but uh, I think the more likely answer set is perhaps what you see here in number three. You know, all those are potential right answers to a question. The answer to two is C, outstanding. The maximum number of shares a corporation can issue under terms of the charter is authorized. So we need to go get a corporate charter. That'll stipulate the voting, lots of things in the corporate charter. So. If we're going to start a corporation, we need to go see attorney, get a corporate charter. Um, this is uh, very testable. This is testable on the SIE as well. Uh, listen, I just warn you, SIE people, if you're going to hang out of these seven conversation, that's fine. I don't think it does you any damage, but you know, uh, make sure you are clear about what's something you need to deal with, something not. If you're on the path towards SIE and seven, I don't think it hurts you at all to uh, get more than you need rather than not enough. So intellectual abundance is better than intellectual scarcity. Anyways, that's then going to be the authorized number of shares. And then out of that, we'll issue a certain portion of them. Uh, so authorized. So uh, this is A. If they would have said shares that have been placed with investors, 
shares that have been placed with investors, that would have been uh, B. If they had been said shares that have been reacquired, reacquired or retired by the issuer, that would be C, treasury stock. And you should definitely know that treasury stock has no voting rights and it pays no dividends. Now, now the issuer, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, by the way, is retiring shares into the treasury. And there's two ways Berkshire Hathaway could have proceeded. Berkshire Hathaway could have just bought those in the secondary market. That's one way to uh, get the treasury stock. But in Berkshire Hathaway's uh, example, they've decided to tender to their existing shareholders and say, hey, listen, do you want to uh, tender your shares, sell them back to the issuer? Uh, Mr. Buffett said he thinks that a way of deciding, you know, finding out which shareholders are more committed long-term than those who aren't, right? The assumption would be if you don't, <laughs> tender your shares. By the way, the existing shareholders like that because if I don't tender my shares and those shares are retired, my proportion ownership in the company is going to go up. Anyways, once again, the answer here is A, but it could have been C. That would have been uh, treasury stock, no voting, uh, and no dividends. Outstanding test question would have been the right answer if it said issued uh, less treasury. So the answer to three was A. Number four, the first date on which a stock no longer trades with a dividend attached, that too is very much a test question. That's the X date, the X date. And remember the uh, other test question, when is it? One business day prior to record. You know, so this is what it is, but I would know when it is. Of all these dates, it's not set by the board of directors. It's a function of the Uniform Practice Code. It's a function of secondary trading. Now in your exam, you don't actually get uh, multiples, but you know, I like multiples because it helps me, you know, ask you things I want to ask you without coming up with four or five different questions, but you won't see multiples, but you are certainly going to on your exam have to contrast rights with warrants. You know, warrants are long term and exercisable above the current market price. The answer here is two and three, or excuse me, uh, two and four. That's very testable. Warrants are usually used as a sweetener you know, sweetener to get people to do things they might not otherwise do. For example, like buy a debenture, buy a bond. And then remember rights are giving to the existing shareholders. The existing shareholders have a right to maintain their proportion ownership in the uh, company. And so uh, there'd be a rights offering, as many shares as you have, that's how many rights you have. And then you can decide as an existing shareholder, where do you want to trade those rights? Whether you want to exercise those rights or do you want those, uh, are you going to let those rights expire? And it makes sense that rights test point are short term and exercisable below the market. If I had said which of the following is true of rights, the answer would have been one and three instead of two and four. You most certainly want to be able to contrast that, uh, those two on your exam. Uh, number six. Well, if the company was worth, you know, X number of dollars, 5450 in this example, with that cash in the corporate shell, and now that cash is going to be uh, distributed. Uh, what's going to happen to the stock? Well, it should go down by the amount of the dividend. So it should go down to A, 54, right? You say, oh man, my stock went down 50 cents. I said, no, 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 the stock went X. And so, you know, assuming you were a shareholder as of record on the, uh, you know, uh, declared or the record date, you're going to get that 50 cents. So it should open up at uh, 54. Uh, P.S. You wouldn't want your orders below the market to be triggered as a result of that dividend. And so, you know, we're going to adjust the orders below the market, buy limits and sell stops, and they will go down by that same 50 cents. Now, if you don't want me to do that, well, then you should say, hey, Dean, on the order DNR, that means do not reduce. Um, here it says a company declared a 50 cent dividend. I had a candidate ask what of the balance sheet equations they're held accountable for. And one that shows up quite a bit is working capital. Working capital is current assets uh, minus current liabilities. And uh, you know, if you get a bad draw, not only would they ask you to recognize that as a balance sheet calculation, current assets or cash are things we plan to turn to cash within 12 months. Current liabilities are things we plan to pay within 12 months. Uh, by the way, you're held account of this on two levels, basically, not only the balance sheet of a, a corporation, but also you know, you're supposed to be able to do a personal balance sheet of your customers. Say, let me figure out your current assets, your current liabilities, your long-term assets. Let's see how what your net worth is. But, for our purposes here, when they declare the dividend, it becomes a current liability of the corporation, meaning it needs to be paid within the next 12 months. And so test point on a bad draw. You know, I told you in these, when we're doing these explications, I'm wishing for you a dream draw. Boy, these scores are exasperating. I had a candidate, got a 71. That's just so exasperating. 71 is not knowledge deficit. And 
I'm dating myself, but back before we had the 30 day wait, that's how far Dean goes back because I'm an OG. Uh, I would just tell you if you got a 71 to just cue this thing back up again and get a different draw because it's very likely you would pass. But now we you know, make you wait uh, 30 days. Now, depending on who your provider is, will depend on what kind of draw that is and how it relates to the actual exam. But my experience has been, you know, you should have a pretty good idea where you're at have, having done your practice files. But back to the original point here, on a face of death draw, I might ask, what's the effect on working capital when a company declares a dividend? And the effect on working capital is it decreases, right? Because I just told you the current liabilities are going to go up. Uh, great mnemonic, you might want to check out, I'm not redoing, you know, the lectures that I've already done, but you might want to check out uh, mnemonics, memory aids, and test-taking tricks uh, that, you know, you might want to do. It's about a 35-minute little lecture if you want to do a data dump sheet or something like that. And the one I'm to use here is DERP. DERP. Declared X record payable. Declared X record payable. So we're looking for something that starts with four. So that looks like it's either going to be B. Looks like we have an inconvenient uh, take break here. So now I need uh, declared X. X emanates from record, by the way, right? That's where the, record, the board sets the record and then the X. And so the X is going to be next, and the X is going to be Roman numeral. Let's go back up here. Two. So I need four, two. Looks like it's B. Looks like it's B based on that sequence. And then remember, I'm, I'm tormenting you here in this uh, practice final on this X day. You are not going to get as many questions as performance opportunities or test questions I have here for you, but boy, you're, you're going to get it one way or another. So as we said, the record date emanates. I try to use bigger words in the actual exam because you know what I'm hoping to do is stretch your mind and hope it doesn't go back to the same spot. But you know, emanates is just a fancy word for where's it come from? And where it comes from is from the uh, record date, right? The answer here is B, uh, you know, or excuse me, X. The X date comes from secondary trading, right? So it's, you know, one business day back of the record set by the board. So uh, the answer here is B is in boy. B is in boy. Uh, cumulative voting. So remember in our corporate charter we discussed, we're going to have two styles of voting. The two styles of voting we're going to have are either statutory, regulatory voting, or cumulative block voting. You know, so if I have, for example, 500 shares and we're voting on three board seats, I have 1,500 votes, I can spend them in any fashion I'd like. And so that protects minority shareholders because the idea is I can load up on any one thing. You know, this company had uh, cumulative voting. The single largest shareholder was off the board of directors. He decided to put himself back on the board by putting all his votes on himself. Hi, guys, I'm back. Him and six guys who can't stand him. Then he voted for his attorney, his attorney, him, his attorney, five guys who can't stand him. You know, so there's still minority shareholders. They got an activist uh, shareholder to help him out and they uh, crossed the 50% threshold. But anyways, it protects minority shareholders. I, this is again a Dean thing. Uh, I'm probably one of the few people, listen, I understand the series seven fantasy land is different from Sir, the, you know, series seven in the real world. But you know, I, I sometimes get into it with people because wrong answers in series seven in the real world are wrong answers in series seven fantasy land. And so, you know, yours truly, there's, you know, these theological debates that, you know, series seven people have, and I have a debate with them, but, you know, I don't like that a lot of providers call this small shareholders. Yeah, small shareholders, but it's, you know, the better answer is minority shareholders. So, well, so. If a corporation declares a dividend, you just definitely, definitely need to know how things pay, how things pay. You know, if it's a stock and they do pay dividends, they would typically pay those quarterly. The answer here is B. Now we do have only one thing on your exam that pays monthly, and that would be a Jenny May. Jenny May pays interest and principal monthly. And then semi-annually would be bonds, right? Bonds pay semi-annually, either J and J, or J and J 15, or F and A, or F and A 15, or M and S, or M and S 15, or A and O. By the way, that means, that's how we speak in the business. It means April and October. A and O 15, M and M, M and N 15, uh, what am I at? J and D, June and December, J and J. So that would be a bond. Um, I don't know if anything D, I think is just the wrong answer. Uh, you know, one of the rights you have as a shareholder, one of the rights you have as a shareholder. So, you know, uh, also provide some input on what lectures you'd like next up on the uh, channel. Uh, I haven't done corporate securities yet. I haven't done corporate securities. Uh, you know, I'm relatively new to this uh, new world we live in and you know, the problem is I'm voiding, you know, uh, content. I could load somebody else's slides and do that. And, you know, prior to February of last year, coming up on the one year anniversary 
of uh, Dean not being able to do, you know, dry erase boards and pens and deliver classes. So I had to learn how to do, you know, PowerPoints and Zoom and that kind of stuff. And I'm still not quite as competent as I'd like to be. So, you know, I have to create the slides and I, you know, they're, they're I don't want the perfect be the enemy of the good. So do I know that slides could be better? <laughs> yes, they could. I'm getting there. I mean, they're, they get better each lecture. I get more competent each lecture on them. But long story short, at some point, I'll be doing the corporate securities lecture. But one of the rights you have in, as a shareholder is you have a right to maintain your proportion and ownership. What that amounts to is you have the first right of refusal on the issuance of new shares. So before we sell those shares to a new shareholders, we're going to have to first go to our existing owners and say, would you like to maintain proportion ownership? The mechanism used for that is a rights offering. So if I'm your broker and I call you and I say, hey, listen, the company in which you own stock in is doing an additional equity financing, uh, they're selling some new stock, you have the first right of refusal. Now, the uh, rights are short-term and exercisable below. And you say, well, Dean, how bad do they need the money? I said, well, you know, it depends on the scenario. If they need it badly, you know, that's one thing, right? And I say, well, I, you know, no, they just start making an acquisition or no, it's a sense of urgency here. Uh, you know, if they don't come with this additional financing, you say, well, Dean, if I don't provide the financing, is there a standby in place? And a standby means regardless of whether the shareholders subscribe or not, there's an investment banking firm that says, whatever your shareholders don't come up with or don't subscribe to, we will do those. This is very much a test question. A standby underwriting is used in a rights offering. That's very much a test question, number 11 here. And it's a type of firm commitment underwriting. So I say to you, well, yeah, Goldman Sachs is standing by. So if you should decide not to, by the way, if you decide not to subscribe, I mean, your shares are not accessible. So you don't have to participate if you don't want to. But if you don't, we're gonna sell the shares elsewhere and you're gonna get diluted. Now, if there's no standby in place, that's a different issue. I said, well, no, there isn't a standby. So it could be an issue of our existing shareholders or if they sell their rights or those people don't subscribe, it may be a problem. Here's the one Dean kind of disagrees with some folks out there, but it depends how you describe the income statement. But you know, shareholders have the first claim on profits. So if there's profits, then the board decides what to do with those profits, whether you know keep them as retained earnings or pay a dividend, do a portion of the earnings as a dividend, you know, in terms of dividend payout ratio. And then no doubt that they have the last claim in liquidation, right? You're the most junior holder uh, of the stock. So that's something to understand. So, right, you know, well, for example, uh, American Airlines, they would file bankruptcy. And so you call me, you say, Dean, I own securities in American Airlines. I say, what do you own? You say, I own the equipment trust certificates. I say, well, no worries. You're at the front of the line. You say, Dean, I own the common stock. I go, ugh, you know, so... Here it's one and it's four. I can't imagine any draw which you don't get asked about the, where shareholders are in liquidation. You have to be able to rank this from junior to senior or senior to junior on your exam. So senior would be the secured bondholders, then the unsecured bondholders, then the preferred, then the common. That's senior to junior. Junior to senior would be the common, the preferred, the unsecured debt, the secured debt. Well, why is it called preferred stock? It's called preferred stock because you have preferential treatment in two things. You have preferential treatment in dividends. They can't pay a dividend to the common if they're in arrears to the preferred stockholders. And you have preferential treatment in liquidation. You are senior to the common. So one and three. And the issuer can't pay a dividend to common if they're in arrears to the preferred stockholders. And if we are liquidating, the preferred stock is second to the last in line. whoop de doo whoop de doo uh, no, you don't have any voting. You know, Berkshire Hathaway owned 50 million shares of Bank of America Preferred, and they were asking Mr. Buffett about how he's going to vote in the uh, meeting of shareholders as shares, shares vote, not people, about Brian Monahan being both the CEO and chairman of the board. And he said, well, my preferred stock doesn't vote, so I can't vote. But if I could, you know, I would vote in favor. He says, we do have 700 million warrants that we're going to exercise into the common. And those, when we do that, we haven't done it yet, but when we do those 700 million shares, we'll be voting with management. So you definitely know that uh, preferred stock has no voting rights. So the answer to this one is one in three. So all that information is testable. Legislative risk, what Congress giveth, Congress can taketh away. So anything with a tax advantage, uh, you know, can be taken away. Right now it was 50%. So the answer is D, but it used to be 70%. You know, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, is collecting over you know billion dollars in dividends from Bank of America, and of the uh, million dollars, well, I think it's more like five hundred million. 
half of that is tax excludable. Half of that is tax excludable. All right, well, if you wanna kill the uh, audio, now would be the time to do so because I am going to do the math here and I'm gonna uh, do the answer. So if you would like to try this uh, using your calculator, please do so, kill the video. And then once you get your answer, come back and uh, I will do it on the screen for you. Okay, so uh, let's see what you did. Uh, uh, we're going to take the 5%. So the first thing we got to be able to do is we got to figure out what that 5% is based on. That 5% is based on par. So the first thing I'm going to do is take that 5% and figure out this pays $5 a year. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. Now, current yield is what an investment pays you divided by what it costs you. So what it pays me here is $5. What it cost me was $80. And so when I take the 5 and I divide by the 80, I come up with a 6.25. And then I'm hoping that's one of my answers, and indeed it is. Uh, by the way, test taking trick, it can't be something you know less than the uh, thing. I, I, if I'm gonna write a different answer set, I put one that's under uh, five and you would be able to do that. So you know you gotta re, you know, figure out what that is before you can do the math here. All right, so did you get 6.25? I hope you did. All right, so now we're on 16. A corporation reports a loss. It does not have to pay interest on which of the following. Income or adjustment bonds only pay interest when and if earned. Income or adjustment bonds are used in bankruptcies and restructurings, and they only pay interest when and if earned. When and if earned. No, that's not true. Subordinated debentures are the full faith and credit of the issuer, and they're a debenture. The subordinated debentures subordinate their claim to the regular debenture holders to get uh, more money. Mortgage bonds are secured by real property. Open end means there's no priority provisions. Closed end means there are priority provisions. Uh, I'm coming to you from Las Vegas, and the Bellagio was financed when it was built through the issuance of $2 billion in mortgage bonds. There are four underwritings of $500 million a piece. Now they were open and that means it doesn't matter whether you bought the fourth set of bonds or the first set of the bonds in bankruptcy, everybody's equal. Now, if they were closed, we would have called the first $500 million series A, the second 500 million series B, and there would be I priority provisions. So the answer here is D is in dog, income or adjustment bonds only pay interest when and if earned. Uh, I had somebody on the uh, subreddit, a candidate, uh, our series seven who is struggling with this idea of accrued interest. You know, accrued interest is what the buyer of the bond owes the seller of the bond. You know, for example, if I own the bonds and you buy them from me, I say, listen, on the next uh, payment date, you're gonna get a check that represents the entire six month time frame, and you didn't own the bonds for the entire six month time frame. I own the bonds for part of that. And you say, well, then when I get paid, I'll give you your pro rata share. I go, no, no, we're gonna figure it out right now. So we're gonna calculate it from the dated date you know, that's a good flashcard. The day to date is the day the bonds start to accrue interest for the next time frame. Let me say that slower if you're making a flashcard as you're going through the exam. If you're making a flashcard, date to date on one side, on the other side, the day the bonds start to accrue interest for the next time frame. That's important. When I get, if it's a J and J bond, for example, when I get paid on July 1st, that's not for July 1st. That's for up to, but not including July 1st. July 1st is the day it starts to grow interest in the next time frame. Now, I haven't had anybody in quite a while tell me they had to do the number of days, but uh, we did that. I showed that to somebody on their exam, and I have one here, and I'll show you how to do it, but that'd be a bad draw, but I would definitely have that idea of day-to-day. -day. But anyways, uh, I gave a, an award to our subreddit participant. Uh, he was a candidate who said, hey, and remember, it's either going to be a 30 or a 16 in the first month, and then spot on. That's exactly right, right? Because if it were J and J 15, July 15th would have been for up to, but not including July 15th, that would have been 14 days, right? And that means 60 is what's for July. Uh, crude interest is on the bonds is calculated up to, but not including settlement. We don't include settlement because settlement is when ownership changes hands and are now the new buyer's bonds and he's entire for the interest that day and every day moving forward. And so the answer to 17 is B. The answer to 18 is A. A, the day the parts to start to accrue interest in the next time frame, 
is from the day to day. So again, this is a common area where people get hung up and I try and spend as much time in areas where people get hung up. It's not as important as you would think, given that I give you four questions in a row here, but you're going to get something about this, right? So the answer to 19 is the day to date. The date the buyer and seller agrees to terms is the trade date, trade date. That's important. So when on our exam, we're saying T plus one or T plus two. That means trade date is when we agree to terms. I, I think of it as kind of like, you know, an escrow period. Settlement is when ownership changes hands. So if I buy a house, I don't give you the money and you give me the title of the house, no. You know, you deposit the money, I deposit the title. And typically 30 days later is when we, you know, uh, ownership changes hands. And you can't renegotiate once we've entered into escrow. It's called reneging. That's a big no-no. Boy, if our escrow period was long, we would have all kinds of people failing if we had an escrow period that was of too long. So under the Uniform Practice Code, we agree to terms, trade date, and then second business day later is when it changes hands. That would be A. The answer here is C, because that's when we agree to terms. Uh, bonds that are secured by the mortgage uh, prop or real property. This is very much a test question. All of these could have been the right answer depending on what you were asked. The answer here is A, mortgage bonds are secured by the real property. The B would have been the right answer if I said, which of the following bonds are secured by major movable equipment? Major movable equipment, rolling stock. You know, very popular like airlines, for example. C would have been right had I said, which of the bonds are secured by marketable securities placed in escrow? Then the answer would be C. If I said uh, bonds that have the full faith and credit of the issuer or the corporation, that would have been D. So the answer here is uh, A. Very, very important. Okay, so why don't you uh, kill it? If you're gonna kill the audio right now or pause, hit pause and see if you come up with the right answer because I am indeed gonna annotate this because it is something we need to be able to do on our exam. Okay, well, welcome back, welcome back. So a conversion price, you really, really gotta be careful on the exam whenever you get the conversion price. The minute you get the conversion price, you say, I need to establish the ratio. I can't do anything with the conversion price. And so we're gonna reset this to, to par. Next thing I wanna make sure is it's a bond because if it's a preferred stock, par is 100. Here it's a bond, so par is 1,000. So I'm gonna take par. And I'm gonna divide by the conversion price. Um, my arithmetic skills are really poor. And so, you know, I'm gonna use a calculator. Anytime I get a choice to use a calculator, I'm gonna use one because I just told you my math skills are terrible. So thousand divided by 50 equals. Now I would tell you, uh, even if your math skills like Dean are weak, you, you want to make sure you get all the math questions that you're entitled to. Because, you know, there's no interpretation of a math question. You know, statistically, the best test takers are people who either love math or hate math. You know, and if you love math or hate math, people who are apathetic about math are not typically good test takers. You know, I don't really enjoy math all that much. I find it incredibly boring that two plus two is, you know, four. Math guys love that. I like things you can talk about you know, for hours and there's no right answer. That drives math guys kind of nuts, like what is beauty? Now we have a couple of pictures of beer and maybe we get closer to it at the end of the day. Um, the vast majority of the test uh, math is division. So if you can't remember what to do, divide. You know, I'd be doing you a favor to cap, cover, cover up your calculator key and you know, get rid of every key except the division key. So if you can't remember what to do on your series seven, divide. And if you can't remember what to divide, take the first number and divided by the second number. Ooh, boy, this one, this one is uh, tough. You know, I wish they were waiting. If uh, you know, you get this one right, woo, uh, I'll give you more than that. I'd give you three, four or five points. Uh, if you'd like to try this before Dean does it, uh, now is the time to hit the pause button and uh, go ahead and attempt it on your own before uh, Dean shows it to you. Okay, well, welcome back and we'll see how you did. So BFD has issued a 8% debenture. So I think what I would do here first is make my flat line, which represents a bond at par. 
where there's all my things there. Here's par. Uh, here's the nominal yield. Remember, the nominal yield doesn't change. The nominal yield doesn't change. Here's the current yield. Here's the yield to maturity, also known as the basis, also known as the basis. All right, so I got that set up there. It says three years later, as corporation with the same credit quality are able to issue bonds at 5%. And so that means interest rates have gone down. And that means the bond has gone up and it should be trading at a premium. All right, so the same maturity, which of the following statements about BFD debentures are true? Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is draw my line based on my seesaw or my teeter-totter and see what it looks like here. Uh, the nominal yield is lower than the yield to maturity. The nominal yield is lower than the yield to maturity. False. The nominal yield is higher. The nominal yield is higher. Yep, that's true. Now, one thing you might want to do is put a T or an F next to that. So I need a, either A or B here because I need a two. The yield to maturity is higher than the yield to call. The yield to maturity is higher than the yield to call. And indeed, that too is true, right? The yield maturity is lower, no. So the answer here is two and three, which is B. Uh, by the way, I, I think that's outrageous. I told you that's an outrageous question, but I, I like it. I still like it because I think it serves our purpose. By the way, uh, this bond is likely to be called and so I should be quoting the yield to call to the customer. Now that yield to call number is still attractive compared to the bonds trading in the primary market right now if I maybe still wants it. You know, do you want to buy new or do you want to buy used? So um, again, uh, I have a couple places where, again, we're just ex explicating an exam. The idea here is not to re-lecture or teach you this stuff. It's just to kind of give you like tack plans on questions. Uh, that being said, uh, there's two areas that you might want to review. I have this in my mnemonic memory aids where I show you the teeter-totter. And it's also in secondary trading in that lecture as well. So two areas for you to find out. Uh, here's some aim and shoot stuff, recognition. We said those are our three styles. You should definitely know that commercial paper, the maximum maturity is 270 days. That's very testable. Uh, you should definitely know that uh, direct obligations will full faith the credit of the United States government. There's no better credit quality than that. And uh, you can certainly avail yourself of that credit quality by buying direct obligations of the US Treasury. That would be T-bills, T-notes, and T-bonds. You can certainly get that credit quality through public housing authority bonds or national housing authority bonds. And you can certainly get that through Ginnie Mays. Now I wouldn't worry so much in this one that D is the wrong answer, but I would definitely know those three, right? I would definitely know A, B, and C have the full faith and credit of the United States government. US treasury securities are book entry, meaning you're kind of confused if you buy a treasury security and say transfer and ship. I say, there's nothing to transfer and ship. The U.S. Treasury has you on the books. They'll send you the appropriate checks at the appropriate times. Uh, a moral obligation bond is a type of municipal bond. You know, uh, maybe uh, John, Free C, uh, John C. Fremont is a hospital district in a small rural community, and they want to uh, do a major modernization expansion of the hospital. And so uh, the John C. Fremont Hospital go goes to the state and says, listen, if... Uh, we default on the bonds, would you, the state, uh, pay the interest in principal? They say yes. If you buy these bonds, they say John C. Fremont, hospital revenue district bonds, hospital revenue district bonds, a moral obligation of the state of whatever, California, let's say. Now, if the bonds default, then the state legislature is gonna take a vote and they're gonna say all in favor of paying back the John C. Fremont hospital revenue district bondholders say aye. If there's more yeas than noes, the bonds get paid back. More nays than yays, the bonds do not get paid back. That whole process is called legislative apportionment of getting the approval, taking the vote. You know, surprisingly, they have a pretty good track record, a pretty good track record. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, when they go to take the vote, the state legislator says, I say, ladies and gentlemen, I wanna point out the uh, presence of Moody's and Fitch's and Standard and Poor's and they're here to see how we do on our moral obligation. If we don't uh, pay them back, they're gonna ding our credit quality. And that will cost a lot more in additional financing than just paying back the bond. So uh, surprisingly, they have a pretty good track record. The answer is A. 
you're going to get a lot of muni questions, lots of muni questions on your exam, you know, munis, mutual funds, uh, and uh, options. Those are big, three big areas, lots of uh, target rich environment, lots of performance opportunities. All the following are used to pay interest on general obligation bonds, except, eh, you know, all the following may be used to pay interest on uh, general obligation bonds, except, you know, I got you two distractors here, two answers that could be right. You know, user fees are not for general obligation bonds. All the following may be used to pay on that. But, you know, states don't typically use property taxes. So, you know, I could make an argument for C or D. You know, you got to go with the most appropriate answer. And so all the following may be used to pay interest. Usually the property taxes are local governments. Oh, I didn't say that. Okay, cool. I didn't say state. So I got myself into a little bit of a, you know, conversation that I didn't need. It's easy now. D is in dog. D is in dog. So income and sales taxes are primarily... Uh, state and property is local, but that wasn't the question. So D is in dog. Uh, you might want to take a sheet of paper and fold it in half and on one side, write all the terms associated with geo bonds and on the other, all the terms associated with revenues. Now I have a really great lecture, one I'm proud of called Underwriting Municipal Securities, Components of the Missile Spread. And I, I used it as an excuse to do a lot of stuff that probably I could put elsewhere. You know, I haven't done a full blown muni lecture. I'm actually thinking I might just turn that uh, underwriting municipal securities in the whole lecture because I could talk about everything in that lecture and be done with it. So maybe I'll redo it. Maybe I'll do it separate, but uh, big target rich environment. Make sure you know all the differences between GOs and revenues. The answer here is D is in dog. The ad of Laram, that's Latin for added value and that's the property taxes. And that's based on the assessed valuations, A, A. They love San Juan, Puerto Rico. You know, Philadelphia has a city income tax. New York City has a city income tax. And so, you know, if you live in New York City and you say, Dean, what bonds can I buy besides New York City that would be exempt from the federal, state, and local taxes? I say territories of the United States government. So Puerto Rico, that's one they love on the test, right? Hawaii, Nevada, Alaska are not territories. They're not going to give the U.S. Virgin Islands or U.S. Micronesia or you know, American Samoa, no, it's going to be Puerto Rico. So make sure you got the territories out. Uh, this is a little overkill. You know, some of the questions I told you, they come in and they disappear and, you know, oh, well, I haven't had anybody tell me in a long time they got a question about the blue list or the offering sheets, but the offering sheets is what, you know, your firm has an inventory and is willing to sell. So, you know, as a baby broker, you know, I might spend a lot of my day cold calling, you know, doctors and attorneys and car dealers and saying, hey, can I put you on the distribution list for Merrill's offering sheets? The mini bonds that Merrill has an in inventory is willing to sell. So haven't anybody tell me they've seen that one in a long time, but it used to be pretty standard fodder. Uh, against the benefit of property, against the benefit of property. So D is in dog. So here, F and A means uh, February and August, February and August. And so we uh, did this trade on Wednesday, May 31st. And so the first thing, I, you might want to hit, hit the pause button and uh, see how you do on this before I reconvene and do it with you. Okay, well, let's see how you did. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out what is settlement. And so settlement is going to be uh, June 1st. Or excuse me, June 2nd, right? So... T plus one is June 1st, T plus two is uh, June 2nd. And so that's the first thing I'm gonna do is get my settlement date. And then I'm gonna say, okay, when was the thing that last paid interest? It last paid interest in February. So I'm gonna be interested in February, uh, March, April, uh, May, and it looks like I might have part of June here. And so now I'm gonna say, okay, so you owe me for uh, all of, I assume I'm the seller and uh, you know, you're the buyer. So you owe me for all of February. Remember every month has 30 days. Uh, you owe me for all of March. You owe me for all of April. You owe me all for May. And you owe me for up to, but not including settlement. So this was the trade date. That's when we agreed to terms. And so you owe me for one day in June. So you owe me 30, 60, 90, 120. You owe me 121 days. 
of accrued interest. Now, uh, I have a shortcut I'd like to show you. So you wanna use my shortcut. You can take settlement, which in this case is 6-2, June 2nd, and you can subtract the last time the bonds paid interest, which in this case was 2-1. And if you wanna use my shortcut, kind of cool, you're in, you're out, you're done. And so that's another way to proceed is by using the shortcut. So I call this for lack of imagination, I call this the long method, and I call this the shortcut. At the other day. Now, I haven't had anybody tell me they've had to calculate the number of days of accrued interest in quite a while, but that used to be standard fare. I can't imagine you're not going to get asked about accrued interest. I did a debrief the other day, and the guy told me he didn't get anything on accrued interest and in settlement. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. I mean, he passed, but you know, that's a unique. Remember, every draw is different. Uh, a lot of times, too, when people say they don't see anything, it's just because they were so prepared for it, it didn't register in their brain housing group. Uh, all the following on revenue bond uh, are used except, remember, we don't use uh, ad valorem taxes. Property taxes are for, you know, GO bonds. And so the answer there is C. Uh, money market securities is high quality debt maturing in less than 12 months. Kind of a trick in corporate notes and treasury notes, two to 10 years. But in munis, uh, these notes are less than one year. So these are money market securities found in tax-free money market funds. Tax anticipation notes. Revenue anticipation notes, tax and revenue anticipation notes, and bond anticipation notes. So uh, very much uh, one, two, three, four. As I told you, it does want to have multiples, but you know, I didn't want to write four or five questions on this thing. You're going to have to turn the fractions into dollars. And so corporates and munis trade in fractions. A lot of ways to proceed. If you want, you can pause now and see if you come up with the right answer. All right, so let's see if you came up with the right answer. There's a lot of ways to do this. I personally like to say, okay, well, 91 is easy. That's 91% of par, par being a thousand. And then I like to think of it, you know, I think it's a mental mess to think of that as five eighths of 1% of par. I think that's what that is. But if you think of it as a bond point being $10, you know, then I think your life gets a little easier because now if you think of five eighths of $10, I just think that's easier. Five eighths of six dollars is six twenty-five, and so there's a lot of ways to proceed. That's the way I like to proceed, is by turning these fractions things. Saying, okay, that's a percentage of ten dollars. Uh, this bond is trading at a discount. This bond is trading at a discount, so that means interest rates have gone up since the bond was issued, causing the bond to go down. Uh, we don't have the you know the nominal yield or any of that other stuff here. Uh, a municipal issuer may refund an outstanding bond may pre-refund. So, you know, the interest rates have gone down, but they haven't uh, passed the call protection period. So the issuer can't call the bonds. So what they're going to do is sell some new bonds so that when the bonds do pass their call protection period, they can refinance. This is not one of the tough ones I, I got here. And if I were in charge, I would give you uh, extra points if you got this one correct. But uh, to do it to re reduce their overall interest burden, yes, so what they're want to make sure that they can do is at the call date, when they pass the call protection period, they could refinance the high cost debt with lower cost debt. Do they do it to lock in today's lower interest rate? Indeed, they do. Yes, they are indeed raising money in advance of the call date because they, if they could, they would have called the bonds, but they haven't passed their call protection bond a period. And can they make an ex a tender offer? Can they go to the people on the old bonds and say, hey, would you like to turn them in? Absolutely. One, two, three, and four. 38 is very testable. That's called the spread, the spread. You know, and then the spread has components. It has the components of the management fee, the additional takedown and the selling concession. Uh, the very testable who opines the bond council B, the bond council and debrief, I had a candidate tell me they got asked who hires the bond council and that would be the issuer, the issuer. A uh, state would receive the least amount from, I like this one, Property taxes, remember said property taxes go to local government, local government. The official notice of sale in the daily bond buyer would mean it's a competitive underwriting where they're saying, attention, attention brokers, we're looking for some help. And then various syndicates would be formed and they'd submit their bids. And so the answer is A. Uh, negotiated would be, uh, there wouldn't be a need, need for a notice of sale because we just sit down with the, the syndicate and negotiate. 
The covenants, the written promises are found in the trust indenture. You definitely should know the trust indenture. They love to torment you on documents on your exam. So make sure you know which document has what. This has a very testable flow of funds. It has the call features. It has, uh, you know, uh, if there's a put feature, all kinds of uh, stuff in it, right? Ooh, okay. This is called decretion. I debate what I should even show this to you. But when you buy a municipal bond at a premium, you have to do straight line amortization downward. And so if you would like to attempt this on your own, now would be the time to pause. Hit the pause button, see if you know how to proceed, and then come back and see how you did. Okay, well, welcome back and let's see how you did. So I debate whether I should even show this to you because you probably get more questions wrong than right. And so when I buy a muni bond at a premium, and indeed this is a muni bond at a premium, I don't get to decide how I'm gonna realize that loss. I have to do straight line amortization downward called decretion. Now the IRS thinks you don't take your last buck and buy a muni bond, they'd be correct. They would be correct. They think you have other things and they think what you'd like to do is buy a bond in the secondary market at a premium that has a higher than today's coupon, nominal yield, fixed or stated rate of return. And they're right, that's exactly what I'd like to do. They said, well, you can do that, but then you don't get to decide when and realize the loss. What, I'd like to do is realize this loss whenever it's convenient for me. The IRS says, no, 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 no. You got a straight line amortization downward called decretion. So I'm gonna take that $60 loss and I got to take it in little bitty hits along the way. And so I'm gonna take the 60 and I'm gonna divide by the eight years to find out how much I need to decrete each year. So if I take 60 and I divide by eight, I find out that I'm going to have to decrease each year seven and a half dollars off my cost base. Right, so I'm going to decrease seven fifty each year, and then it tells me that I've had the bond for six years, so I'm going to times that by six years. So I take uh, 750 times six years. I find out I should have decreted 45 bucks. And so I'm gonna take my 1,060, 750, 750, 750, 750, 750. And now I'm gonna take my original cost base and I'm subtract the 45 and I get my adjusted cost base of 1,015. And so that's my adjusted cost base. And then I got to put that back into a uh, bond speak. Boy, you know, that's one question, but if that's the difference between passing or not, well, then it becomes an issue. You know, on debrief, I say, hey, did you have to decrease any mini bonds purchased at a premium? And about half the time somebody says yes, half the time they say no. So, you know, um, this might be an area where if you want to go through that a little slower, you might want to hit the rewind key and uh, you know, again, tempt it on your own and then see how you did. So first thing I had to do is recognize this was a muni bond purchased at a premium. Let me just clear up the thing. I say, okay, that's a muni bond purchased at a premium. So I'm gonna have to amortize that loss. So I gotta know that that's 1,060 and I know I'm getting back par. And so I know I'm gonna have to write this down over each year. I'm gonna take it in little itty bitty hits rather than one fell swoop when it's convenient for me. So I take 60 and I divide it by eight years. And I found out that was seven and a half. I'm gonna to have to write down each year. And so then I took the seven and a half times the six years. And I figured out I should have, uh, I need to adjust this cost base by 45. So. Uh, I kind of ran it through it again. So one question, but you know, if it's the difference again between passing or not, then it becomes an issue, right? So you know, those scores are exasperating. Oh my goodness. You know, I hate those words when somebody calls it, I got a 71 or a, you know, something like that. This is very much an answer set, very much an answer set. And to establish or add to, you've got long position, you're going to do an opening purchase. 
I had somebody who's struggling that I think I've got this answer set in every lecture, every practice question. This is on the SIE, it's on the seven. So make sure you understand the types of orders we use to establish. If it said establish a short position, the answer would be B. Here it's A, but it very much could have been B. And then how we get rid of them is C and D. Well, there you go. So now I'm asking you, tormenting you here, eliminate or reduce would be a closing sale. The answer to 45 is B. And that is very much an answer set that you should be prepared for. Uh, we don't want the uh, options wagging the stock and <laughs> looks like that's starting to happen in GameStop, right? We got the options there, you know, the tails are wagging the dog, so to speak. And so the position limits are, applied to, are set by the OCC and they apply to the class as the type plus the stock, the type plus the stock, Apple calls, Apple puts, you know, class, that would be the type plus the stock. Series mm -hmm. is the most complete description. That's everything. That's the type plus the stock plus the expiration plus the strike. All right, sequence set here. Now in the test uh, sequence sets, you're either gonna make three points or lose four points. They don't do as much sequence set stuff as they used to. Um, again, if you want to try these on your own, you can just hit the pause button and try that uh, and see how you do. So this isn't a re-lecture of options. My goodness, I have eight options, eight hours of options lectures for you. So, you know, you're supposed to do them in sequence. So lecture one was I asked you in lecture one, I introduced the concept of an option contract and its nomenclature. It's a little bit of about an hour. The second lecture is the basic positions like this one. Uh, that's the four basic positions that we see we're looking like we're running into here. Uh, the third lecture is on hedging, stock plus options. And the last lecture is multiple option strategies. Uh, I highly recommend you go through those. And then I have a fifth lecture of the four that's just an example of all these questions. All right, so I established here the choice to buy 100 shares of BFD at 70 at four. Uh, again, if you want to try this on your own, now would be the time to do so. Now would be the time to do so. Hit pause, come back, see how you did. All right, well, the way I like to proceed is with a T. And so what I like to do is track money in and out of the account. And so that's money out. That's money in. And so I uh, paid uh, four points. And so if the stock is 68 or lower, the contract is going to expire. And I'm going to lose $400. Whenever you buy an option position, the worst case is you lose your money. The break even is going to be strike price plus premium. Strike price plus premium. If you're going to memorize break evens, so that's not a bad way to proceed. But if you're going to memorize break evens, I highly recommend that you put next to that break even where you want the stock to be in relationship to that. And here I want the stock to be above that. Now, another way you could have proceeded, another way you could proceed is you could say, okay, well, I paid four points to be able to buy the stock BFD at 70. And if you get good at a T, then you can just track the money, look at the answer set and say, okay, I need a number that if I plug it in here, it would make the columns balance. Indeed, that is the break even. So a lot of ways to go. Uh, if I'm right, ooh, what might BFD be trading at? So, you know, one of the reasons I like buying call contracts is because I have limited risk, but I have unlimited reward. I have unlimited reward. So the answer 49 is D. Uh, now they asked me to do closing a closing transaction at intrinsic value. Now you could have just compared 80 here. You could have just compared 80 to the break even and that would have worked. You know, 80 is 16 points in the right direction. So that's one way you can proceed on this. But uh, you know, I'd like you, if you can get good at tracking money and you're not fumbling around with contract specifications, you're gonna be pretty good. Oh, I'm sorry, 10 points of intrinsic value, right? So here, uh, you can try it now if you'd like. Let me get my my screen up here. All right, so hit pause if you want to try it, and then I'll show it to you. Okay, welcome back. I'm going to do a T. That's how Dean likes to proceed, dollars out versus dollars in. And so I was out four. I like to do things on a per share basis. And so this is a 70 call. The stock is now 80. And so now that's worth 10 points. 
you know, and then I would say, okay, but I'm talking about, you know, one contract. And so I made $600, six points. Well, that's six points on one contract governing a hundred shares. And the customer was bullish and the customer was bullish. Oh, well, we said every contract has two parties. So this is the same uh, contract. It's just now we're looking at the person who's short, the person who has created an obligation to deliver that stock at uh, 70. That's what that means. That's an obligation to sell the stock at 70. And so I didn't ask you about the player here. I just asked, when is a 70 call at expiration? And it says it's at 70. So, whoop. And so here again, I like making a T. You don't have to do that. You can just memorize this stuff. It's not a lot of memory work on the basics anyways, but so if uh, I, I receive four and the stock is 70, the contract expires, I get to keep four points on each contract. That's $400, same break even. The break even is the same, whether you're long or short, it's just a matter where you want it in relationship to that break even. And as I said, if you're going to memorize break-evens, you might want to put an arrow next to the break-even and remind yourself where you want it to be in relationship to that. You know, I show it to you this way sometimes in the lecture. There's the strike price of 70. There's the market price. And, you know, here's what you collected. There's the break-even of 74. Below here, there's no intrinsic value. The contract expires. So you're gonna gain uh, $400. Uh, break even is 74. The customer is bearish. The maximum gain is the premium. You, should, you shouldn't be struggling with maximum gain in short calls, short puts, short straddles, short spreads. You agree to be a potential victim. Nobody victimizes you, neener, neener, neener. You keep the money. So the max gain is 400. Maximum loss, guaranteed cash desk question. If you agree to sell stock you don't own, if you agree to just, uh, uh, sell stock you don't own, you have unlimited loss potential. That's very much a test question. Uh, I'm gonna do the T, so see if you can do it now. Pause. Once you figure it, same thing you got it, then uh, start over, start the, the thing again. A lot of ways to proceed here. One way is just to compare 80 to the break-even. The break-even is 74 and 86 points in the wrong direction. So it's a $600 loss. But you know, if you're trying to practice your skills, you know, here we did an opening sale. That's how we established this position. And uh, we had uh, got four points. Now, again, I told you, I wouldn't put four points in there because that's a mental mess. And the way I'm going to get rid of that, remember, is I'm going to do a closing purchase. A closing purchase. And so that's going to be dollars out. And we're looking at, uh, it's an 80, uh, 80 is the stock, the call is 70. And now the stock is at 80. And so the intrinsic value is 10. So again, that's, you know, 10 points on one contract governing 100 shares. So the gain or loss is going to be a $600 uh, loss. You don't have to do all that work. I would tell you that if you get good at tracking money though and you get good at contract specifications, you'll be better, you know, doing options. Uh, well, you know what you might wanna do is offset your obligation to sell with a choice to buy. And so what you might wanna do is a poor man's covered call by taking part of your money and buying a higher strike call contract, A. A, that's called a credit call spread, you know. Use the following to answer the next eight questions. Oh my goodness, eight questions. So you buy a put when the stock's at 72. So if you only remember one thing about options, call up, put down, the breaking, by the way, it doesn't matter where the stock's at. That's just there to mess you up on your exam. So be careful when they tell you where the stock's at. That's the mess you up. It doesn't matter where the stock's at when you do the trade. It matters where the stock's at when you close the trade. So the break even is 66. As I mentioned, if you're going to memorize break evens, you might want to put a little arrow uh, down to remind yourself where you want it. 
This is a much smarter way to be a bear because when you buy a call or here you're buying a put or you buy a straddle or you uh, buy a spread, one reason to do so is if you're wrong, you just lose $400, A, A. That's a smarter way to be a bear. Of all the bearish transactions you can do, that's a smart bear. Boy, I bet you wish you would have bought a put on GameStop and not to have uh, you know shorted it. The maximum gain is when the stock goes all the way to zero. So the maximum gain is when I can stick the stock, put the stock to somebody at 70 and the stock is worthless. I paid four to get going. And so I can max gain is 6,600. A lot of ways to think that strike price, less premium to zero or strike price or break, e or break even to zero or break even, however you want to get there. Uh, you did an opening purchase because it's a long position. Remember the stock was 72. So if the stock is uh, higher than 70, the contract expires and you lose your $400. Uh, 64, see if you can do that. You can just memorize, by the way, that that's four points in the right direction. And so it's going to be a $400 gain. So you can memorize break-evens, perfectly acceptable. Say, Dean, my break-even is 66. I'm a bear. The stock is 62. That's four points in the right direction. I'm done. Uh, certainly. Uh, but if you want to try and set up a T, if you want to try and set up a T, now would be the time to do so. Hit the pause button. I'll be back and we'll see how you did. So, okay. So here we go. So uh, I paid four. This is dollars out again. This is dollars in. And it says B of D is at 62. So the customer buys the stock, uh, exercise of the put. That's what that means. The customer buys the stock, exercise the put. That means I stuck it to somebody at 70. And so that's what the T would look like uh, based on that scenario. By the way, I always put, if I'm going to subtotal columns, some people like to do that, some people don't. I always put a line just to remind myself, this is me doing math. That's not something that was a trade. That's a trade. That's a trade. That's a trade. You can see why brokers love options because it generates significant commissions. Uh, 65 is the same question intellectually. Question uh, 65 is the same question, right? I mean, there's three things that can happen to an option. It can be traded, it can be exercised, or it can expire. We just looked at where it got exercised. And so now this question says, it says it got traded. So again, I'm gonna set up my T Dollars out, dollars in. I paid four points for the put. And now the stock is uh, 62. There's my strike price. There's 62, 62. Whoop. And so if I compare those two numbers, I'm gonna do my closing transaction. Or this was a here closing sale. That's the closing sale. I did an opening purchase. Pretty cool. So uh, the answer, no matter how we do it, it's a $400 gain, no matter how we go about getting there. The customer is bearish. When you buy a put, you're bear. Every uh, transaction has its opposite. So here's the guy who short the put. If we're gonna have putters, we gotta have put ease. The breaking is still 66, put down. If you only remember the thing, call up, put down, 66. If you're gonna memorize break evens, I suggest you put an arrow next to that 66 to know that you want BFT to be 66 or higher. The maximum loss is when somebody makes you pay $7,000 or 70 points for worthless stock. You get to keep the 400, and so you lose 6,600. The maximum gain is you agree to be a potential victim. Nobody victimizes you, and you get to keep the money. And so maximum gain is the premium, 400. BFT remains unchanged. Remember, the stock was 72, so that means the put expires, neener, 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 and I keep the $400. Uh, oh, now the opposite. So here's the two opposite T's. Let's see if you can set that up. Hit pause and see how you do setting that up and then we'll do it together. So the first version here, remember we said T, trade, exercise, expire. So the first version here is the contract gets uh, exercised. So here's my T, dollars in versus dollars out. Some people like to use plus signs, minus signs, you know, whatever floats your boat. I like to use dollars out, dollars in, but some people like to use debit. Some people like to use credit, you know, whatever. Anyways, we start out here, remember, by uh, selling this thing for four. And now it says the contract gets exercised and the stock is 62. So now I'm going to pay 70 for the stock. 
and I sell it at the 62. And again, just another way of saying I lost 400. Remember the other guy made 400, so I lost 400. Now you didn't have to do that. You could just memorize break even 66, 62 is four points in the wrong direction. Now this other version of this, the next version says, again, I make my T, that I close it out at intrinsic value. So the stock is 62. Well, oh, it didn't ask me to close it out. It just said, what would I do to close it out? Yeah, I remember I did an opening sale, so I would do a closing purchase. You know, what I'm hoping to do is sell the contract high and buy it back low. All right, so let's look, see what's next here. Oh, that's a covered call. It's certainly gonna get one of those. So let's see uh, if you're gonna try and do these next three questions. Now hit the pause button, attempt it. When you're done, come back and we'll see how you did. All right, well, welcome back. So let's see how you did. Uh, again, I'm a big believer in setting up a T. That's how I proceed. So I always like to make a T. And you know, my T represents dollars out versus dollars in. And boy, when you see 100 shares, boy, that's really important on the test. Because you gotta say, oh, this is not an option position. My matrix doesn't work. I wasn't using the matrix in the last set, but I could have. I mean, I could have had my quadrants and gone over my quadrants and, you know, well. Anyways, uh, I bought the stock at 49 and I uh, sold a 50 call at four. The market rises to 55. Well, I don't participate past 50. You know, that's Tesla. Well, no, there's a ceiling here. I'm not gonna participate past the strike price. I gotta give up that stock at 50. If I didn't want to do that, I shouldn't have written that call contract, right? So the most I'm going to make is $500. Now, again, um, I wouldn't worry too much about the gain, but just know you don't participate past the strike price. That's the disadvantage of this transaction. All right. Well, again, I like to make a T. If you, you know, if you get good at the T, then you don't need to memorize a bunch of stuff, but you know, however you want to proceed. And again, this is the one time of the one time only. It's not call up. It's not call up. I paid 49 for the stock. I brought in a four points for the option. I like to put those in different uh, areas myself so I can make my analysis. Now, by the way, if you get good at the T and track the money, you don't need to memorize that the maximum, uh, the break even in a covered call is stock cost less premium. You don't need to memorize that because now you can just shop your answers until you plug one in that makes the columns balance. I go, oh, ding, 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 ding. So you can either memorize the break even the stock cost uh, minus premium. Uh, we already did the maximum gain here. We said the maximum gain is when you deliver the stock at 50. So you make it 1.49 to 50 plus the four points on the premium and so that's how you make your max gain of $500. That's a covered call. The vast majority of your questions on the exam are gonna be basic positions and covered calls. Uh, the customer is uh, very much a test question. They're generating additional income. B, very much a test question. They're generating additional income. They're bringing in $400. How would you like to agree, get paid $400 to agree to sell I, 50, stock you just bought at 49? They get a partial edge, but the main thing there is to generate additional income. All right, here's another three. Again, shares, this is stock plus options. So uh, hit the button now, uh, pause, see how you do, and then hit the uh, play button and we'll see how you did. Uh, the first thing I would tell you, so welcome back. First thing I would tell you is, boy, make sure when you're doing your practice questions, you recognize shares because it's an entirely different game if you are hedging, if you are doing options and stocks together. All right, so I'm gonna make a T just to get going here. So there's my T and it says, I bought a hundred shares. Let's get that, that's gonna be my dollars out. And this is gonna be dollars in. And let me do my, so I can, whoop. I need to get this so I can see what's going on here. So we bought 100 shares of BFD at uh, 72. Whoop. That's going to be dollars out. And then we bought a 70 put at four. That's dollars out. 
And so we're out uh, 76, 72 for the stock and four points for the protection because now we have right to sell air. So BFD falls to 55. BFD falls to 55. Well, keep one, I ain't gonna sell it at 55, right? I have a choice to sell it at 70, which is the whole point of this transaction. So I'll exercise my put, my choice to sell at 70 and I lose $600. Cool. Uh, by the way, this is the one time and the one time only, the one time and the one time only to get the break even. I'm not uh, subtracting in a put. And the reason I'm not subtracting is because this is not an option position. So you can either memorize that the break even is the stock cost plus the premium. Or you can just know, okay, well, it's got to be a number that if I plug it in there would make it balance. That doesn't make it balance. That doesn't make it balance. Boom. 76 is the break even. So a couple ways to proceed, a couple ways to proceed. Uh, the break even, we just did that one. In relationship to the position, why did you buy the put? The reason you buy the put is you don't have to sell if you don't want to. You still have a uh, the opportunity to participate in a big price increase, number one, but not participate in a big price decline, number two. So the answer is C, that's why you do this. This is just a recognition question. And you just got to recognize that here, you're not effectively hedged. You don't need an obligation to buy back the barn stock, you need a choice. So D, so that's just recognition. I did all the T's in the lecture, showed it to you in lecture three. And I also show it to you again, I think when I got those nine working models for you, but this is just recognition. Uh, a, you don't have unlimited risk. D, B, you don't have unlimited risk. C is effectively hedged. D is not, the answer is D. All right, so the next thing we gotta do is this next one. This is a multiple option strategy. This is a multiple option strategy. This is I'm long the call, I'm uh, long a put. So this is a straddle, this is a straddle. And so we've identified as a straddle. We're gonna get our upside break even of uh, 78 and our downside break even of uh, 70 minus eight, 62. So again, uh, let's give you an opportunity to try this. Let me move it down a little bit here, see what you how you do. And uh, give a minute, hit the pause button. And when you come back, we'll do it together. Okay, well, welcome back. Uh, I like to uh, get my T fired up or get my uh, matrix fired up and say, okay, boom, boom. And that's a straddle. What I'm straddling is 70. That's the strike price line. And that's what I'm straddling. And here's the market price of the stock. And I paid uh, four points for the call and four points for the put. So my upside break even is 78. My downside break even is 62. We don't do things to break even. We do things to make money. So I need this thing. I'm buying the volatility. Again, in the explication, we're not trying to re-lecture. We're just seeing how you did based on having done your lectures, having done your practice problems, having done your work, basically, right? And so now the stock goes to 90. So you want to memorize break evens. You know, you can just say 12 points. You just compare that. Uh, here it says the call is exercise. So the other way I could do is get my T fired up four and four, and it says the call is exercise. So I have a choice to buy at 70. And then it says, I sell the stock, the stock's at 90. And that's just another way of saying, I made 12 points. Now I made these practice exams, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of our journey through this explication, I said the real test has a balance of easy and difficult questions. And I've given you only the most difficult questions and concepts you could expect to see. All right, so the break even is 62 and 78. And again, if you need to, you can just rewind and do that again. Uh, 70, boy, that sucks. 70 means both of those contracts expire and I lose my money, I lose $800. Anytime you buy, uh, sell an option position, or excuse me, anytime you buy an option position, you buy a call, you buy a put, buy a straddle, buy a spread, you lose your premium. So here you lose $800. Uh, a, very much a test question, why do you use a, uh, a straddle because you expect volatility, but direction's uncertain. That's very much a test question, 84A. 
you know, if you join me on the lecture, remember there's four things you got to do, be able to do on your series seven as it relates to uh, a strata. You got to identify it, you got to calculate the break evens, determine where it's profitable, and when do you use it? Those are the four things. And that was a straddle. So the answer is D. That's can you identify it? All right. So our next one here again, uh, why don't you go ahead and see how you do? Hit the pause button and see how you do on this next uh, uh, 86 and 87. Okay, well, welcome back. Let's see how you did. Let's see how you did. Uh, I like to kind of uh, get going here by stacking my premiums here. And so what I mean by that is I like to say, okay, well, there's my 70 and there's my 80. And so what I've done here, task question number one is this is a spread. What I'm spreading is the difference in the premiums. That's what I'm spreading is the difference in the premiums. When I did the spread, the difference in the premiums was three, you know, in terms of dollars out and dollars in. So here is my uh, 70 call and I brought in four for that one. And here is my 80 call. And I paid for that one one. So this is a credit spread. Now, once you get a credit spread, now what we're referring to is the difference in the premiums, the hardest part to get, but you don't need to get it because once you get a credit, you can tell me expire narrow and you'll be right every time. Credit expire narrow always goes together. We want the contracts to expire so you can keep the money, that would be great. By the way, another way of saying it is it, it narrowed from three to zero. So you make $300. That's the hardest part to get. Don't need to get it. That goes together all the time. So two and three. Now there's no multiples on the test. That would be separate questions on the actual exam. Uh, what else do you have to be able to do on a spread? You've got to be able to, to do the gain and the loss. Whatever the gain and the loss are, they add up to the difference in the strikes. We already have the gain already, which is the net premium. You have to be able to do break even. You have to be able to do bullish or bearish. So that's what you got to be able to do on that. Let's see if I've uh, asked you that question. Yeah, the maximum potential loss is the difference in the strikes, which is kind of cool, right? Because here was our, uh, let's just go back here. I'm pretty sure it was a 70 call and an 80 call, right? Yep. And so I'm saying I want to play between here and here, and then I don't want to play no more. So there's my whoop. There's my 70 call. There's my 80 call. Uh, here is my T. And so the maximum potential loss is when I have to buy the stock at 80 and deliver it to 70. I lose 10, but of the 10 that I can lose, three is already in my account, right? So here's my three and there's my seven. So that's the whole point. There's a floor at 70 and there's a ceiling at 80. So, the gain loss always equals the difference in the strikes. Maximum gain is when the contracts expire, $300. So what do you have to be able to do in a spread? You've got to be able to identify it as a spread, determine credit or debit, expire or exercise, narrow or widen, gain and loss. We said the gain and loss always equals the difference in the strikes. You got to be able to do break even. You got to be able to do bullish or bearish. Test taking trick, the break even has got to be somewhere between 70 and 80. So, you know, the, the whole point of a spread, what, whoa, whoa. The whole point of the spread is I'm saying I want to play between 70 and 80, and then I don't want to play no more. And so here, a test taking trick is you can toss out any offer 
to you that isn't between the strikes because that's the whole point i mean we basically said you know we want to play between these two numbers and then we don't want to play no more so you know we said that the most we can make is three and the most we could lose is seven you know i thought i was helpful i think of you know this is the floor and this is the ceiling and so it'd be bad form for you to tell me that the break even isn't a number between there i mean that's the whole point of the break even so we have a mnemonic for that the mnemonic we have for break evens and call, call spreads is call add to the lower call add to the lower the way we get the break even is we're going to take the lower strike x premium strike we're going to add the net premium doesn't matter whether it's debit or credit whatever it is and we get 73. now i would stay menu driven i wouldn't be thinking about it until you get it all done but you know when you get this all done you say okay well yeah these contracts expire yeah you know, if I, you know, buy the stock at 73 and I deliver at 70, I'd lose three points. I got three points. I break even, but don't think about it until you get it done. Now, uh, the next thing we got to do is determine whether we're bullish or bearish. Do we want the stock to go down or do we want the stock to go up? You know, bulls attack horns up, bears attack paws down. Uh, I want the stock to go down. The larger premium dominates and it's a short call. I'm hoping ideally that the stock is below here and the contracts expire and I keep the money. So I am bearish here. A credit call spread is always gonna be bearish. All right, so let's see where we're at. So we had about what, 20 option questions there. You're gonna get on your exam about 20 option questions. I gave you real tough ones. These are real tough, but you know, oh well. Okay, I like this one in a falling market Remember, it's the orders below. It's very testable orders below the market. And we have a mnemonic for that. So let's give you a chance to try this one. Pause. Are you back? Let's see how you did. A good way to remember this is the orders that below the market are bliss. Buy limits and sell stops. One and three. Again, you don't get multiples on your actual exam, but I think they're productive in terms of practice finals and explication. So. You know, we don't, these are the ones that are going to get triggered as the market goes down. Remember, the others are above the market, so the market going down wouldn't cause those to be triggered. Oh, I like these types of orders. How are we going to protect a long stock position? We said stop orders are used to stop losses, protect profits, or establish stock positions. And so I would place a sell stop to protect the position B. So we use it to stop a loss. Here we don't need to stop a loss because we got a gain. Now we're using it to protect a profit. The answer is B. In a short stock position, we would use a buy stop. I tell my broker it trades at or through. Go ahead and send me home. Buy stop A. Uh, beta is very testable. Beta is a measurement of a stock's volatility as compared to the market as a whole. Very testable. And so you have two things you can do here on a high beta stock. You bought it, so remember you're worried about it going down. So you can either put a sell stop or you can buy some puts, two or three. That would be two ways to protect that. So now you're short the stock, so you want to be able to either place a buy stop you know, say, oh, I like this one. So buy stop at 57, customer sold short at 72, since declined, oh, let's see what it declined to, 55. So, yo, we got a profit here. So now I'm going to be interested in protecting that. So I'm going to tell my broker, listen, been a good ride down. Let's not give it back. So put a buy stop at 57, or uh, I can buy some call contracts. So it's one or three, three. I didn't know we can actually move this thing without using the thing. I wish I would have known that 97 questions ago. <laughs> Anyways, if you've got a market order to buy, you're going to buy at the asking price. And what you want is the lowest ask, right? D. Uh, my secondary market lecture is very, very good. I mean, obviously, I think it is. But, you know, a lot of times I'll redo lectures if I you know think they, they need to be. I will eventually redo them all because I go through and, you know, 
think, oh, I should have said this, I should have said that, and, you know. But as I mentioned, I don't let the perfect be the enemy good. I still post them and then I, you know, mess around with them and change slides and, you know, edit them. But anyways, long story short, I forget what my point was. I had a point. Oh, my point was that lecture is pretty damn good. So check out that secondary market lecture. I mean, it's it's good. It has a lot of this for you. And that might be even overkill. And then I also have the the other lecture on types of orders that I think I go over that as well. So, uh, you know, a good investment of two or three hours of your life, if, you know, to pass the seven, right? You're making an investment in yourself. Anyways, that would be the lowest ask possible. Uh, order to sell 100 shares. Uh, this now, this guy's being picky. That's going to be a stop limit, right? He's got two qualifiers or contingency. He says, Dean, if it trades out or through 70, uh, I want to uh, sell it, but if I'm not, if I can't get 69 or more, I go picky, picky, D. 99 is very much a test question. You should definitely know that new issues and options cannot be purchased on margins, so one and three. Uh, they have uh, actually moved a lot of the economics. It's still in the FINRA test specifications, but they aren't asking it for series seven top off. I think because they've moved it uh, to the SIE. So, you know, um, I don't think you'll see this. But if the Fed wants to increase the money supply, they would uh, decrease the reserve requirement and they would buy government securities two and three. A uh, buyer of a call option has all the following, except they have limited risk, true. They might be using it to protect a short stock position, true. They have a more levered position, true. And no, 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 it doesn't protect your long stock, it protects short stock, so D is false. Uh, I like this one. This one, you know, there's nothing like this on the test. This is just me wanting to go over all the various permutations of this. Uh, I think this might be overkill. I told you I had a guy in debrief tell me he didn't get any of this, which I found astounding, but you know, oh well. Uh, so let's look at our first one. Customer payment and a cash or margin account under Reg T. We never tell customers this, but they actually get two business days after the settlement. So it's T plus two plus two. It's actually four. The answer to that one is D, two business days after settlement. We don't tell them that we don't want to use our money. I feel bad that nobody understands that, but that's why Robinhood is struggling because the DTC, the Depository Trust Corporation says, we don't care about your customer. You're buying all this GameStop stock and you need to settle up. You know, they had to go get what, a couple billion dollars. <laughs> so they didn't have the money to front the customers. Most of us have enough money to do that. But uh, the customer at Robinhood has two additional days to actually pay for the Robinhood stock. Remember house, or excuse me, the uh, GameStop stock. Please note, you know, the, the, the house requirement may be that they don't honor that. So they're not doing very good articulating. Schwab did it a couple of days earlier. So, oh, well. Anyways, the answer to that is uh, D. Uh, settlement for options is one business day after trade date, B. Uh, uniform practice code is T plus two. So, oh, it doesn't look like I've actually got that as a choice. Yeah, it should be two business days after the trade date. So my bad. I'll have to fix that. Uh, two business day after settlement, government securities would be T plus one. So that would be B. Uh, if you fail to deliver it to protect you from having an open short position, I close you out 10th business day from the settlement. So that's E. And the index options, both the option and the exercise are T plus one. That's B, B. Uh, put down, put down. So the option contracts have intrinsic value at 68. It has two points of intrinsic value. Remember at 70, it would be at the money, at the money. Again, they don't do multiples on your test, but I put them in here because I think they're productive to talk about. Uh, which of the long or true regarding the customer who buys a call option? They expect the stock to go up, not down, right? So it's two. She pays for the choice to buy. Yep, three. So it's two and three, A. Uh, eliminate a short position. I told you that answer set. I have it in here over and over and over again because it's just, you're going to get it. You won't get four or five of them like I've done here, but you're going to get get that answer set. And so the way we get rid of that is to do a closing purchase. A, closing purchase. Uh, treasury notes are two to 10. B, B, you know, 11 to 30 is a bond. A new issue bond has a provision that can't be called for five years. And it is called, it'll be at a premium. This is advantageous to you in a declining interest rate environment, A. Boy, if anybody ever asks you about economics, finance or investments and you wanna sound smart, you should say it has a lot to do with interest rates. If you just keep your mouth shut, you'll sound good, you'll sound good. So uh, A. 
uh, a sell stop would be placed below the support level B, B, you know, on the test will be the only time the charts look like they're supposed to look. By the way, those uh, sell stops can accelerate bullish trends. Any place a buy stop above the resistance level, A. Uh, 116 is a, a guaranteed test question. You know, when I say it's a test question, that just means it's somewhere in the draw. When I say it's a guaranteed test question, that just means I know of no draw in which you're not going to get asked the question. So the OCC is the issuer and guarantor of all options. Very testable. You definitely need to know that index options are you deliver the cash. Listen, nobody would write an index option if what I had to deliver was 100 stocks of the underlying stocks on the Wilshire 5000, for example. No, I deliver the cash if I'm the writer. Where the cash is delivered, uh, T plus one. By the way, in the equity options, I have to deliver the stock, right? Or the money, right? So that's a little different. Open end mutual fund. I like this one. I wrote this question because in open end mutual fund, there is no secondary market. And so the board sets all these in open and mutual fund because there's no secondary. It's a primary market and it's going to be DREB, declared record X payable. So uh, make sure you're reading carefully. Remember RTFQ stands for read the full question. So this is not a, a stock trading in the secondary market. It's not a closed end fund. It's an open end fund. Uh, and then again, it would be a different order, a different sequence, right? It would be DREP, so it's declared record X. The X in an open-end mutual fund is the day after the record date. So, so it's gonna be, uh, let's see, what would that be? One, three, two, four, one, three, two, four, B. All right, here's some margin questions for you. Why don't you see if you can set those up uh, and then come back and we'll see how you did. So we hit the pause button, hit the pause button and try and work these out. Uh, I'll show you, uh, let's see if I can shrink this enough to get them all on the same page. There we go. All right, there you go. There's all of them for you. One, two, three, four. Five. That's total overkill, by the way, on the test. You're not getting six margin questions on the test. You're getting three or four, and I doubt they would be this complex. But, you know, as I told you, unlike the real test, which gives you a balance of easy and difficult questions, I give you everything. All right, so you hit the pause button. You're working on the questions and now it's been, I don't know how long it's been, but now I'm back and now we'll go over it together. Now we'll go over it together. So one thing you gotta be able to do on your test, let me get this big enough, so. Is you wanna be able to do the classical margin equation. The classical margin equation. And so let me get a good color here. So I'm going to buy 1,000 shares of the stock at 72. So that means I'm going to have 72,000 in long market value. My broker dealer is going to lend me $36,000. And I'm going to have to put up. Oh, what color should we use that? $36,000. That's gonna be my initial setup. That's my initial setup. I would definitely know the classical margin equation is long market value minus debit balance equals equity. So remember that's gonna be T plus two plus two. So as a margin clerk, I want $36,000 from you and I want a T plus two plus two. Uh, now that I've done the setup, Right, we're gonna loan you half, that's called your debit register or your debit balance is what you owe the brokerage firm. Remember that's based on, that's based on broker call. That's based on broker call, the interest you're paying. Uh, below, what would there be a maintenance call? So the way we do that, very testable, is we take the debit, which in this case is 36 grand. And we divide by 0.75, and that's going to give me market value at maintenance. So I'm going to take my calculator, 36,000. By the way, that's very testable. I would definitely be able to do that. And I come up with 48 grand. Uh, hopefully, that's one of my choices. Indeed, it is. Indeed, it is. All right, so now let's see. Whoop. Uh, it goes to 80. So now it goes to 80. So now I'm going to do a mark to market. I'm going to do a mark to market. So 80. 
That's my new long market value. You still owe the broker term $36,000. That is the debit register. This is called the mark to market. And let's see what my equity is now. So I'm gonna take 80,000. Uh, I'm gonna minus 36,000. And so my equity is now 44 grand. Equity always represents what you'd have if you, if you sold the stock and paid off the loan. Nobody is suggesting you do that. I always want to see if perhaps I can't loan you more money because it's one of my all five time favorite things to do. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take uh, reg T. Reg T is half of this. And see what I uh, can loan you money to buy. So reg T. Uh, reg T is $40,000. And so I say, listen, Reg T says you only need to be at risk for 40 and you're at risk for 44. Reg T says that on $80,000 in collateral, I can loan you 40 grand and you've only borrowed 36. You have 4,000 in excess equity, 4,000 in excess equity. Now, I don't think on the test this would be a problem, but you know, it's not actually the same thing as SMA, but for our purposes, I can't imagine any question you're gonna mess up on that. So you can either have that SMA, excess equity is cash, or you can use it to buy additional securities. And so either 4,000 in cash or $8,000 in buying power. Buying power. All right, so let's see what they wanna know. It looks like they wanna know how much cash can you have? You can have 4,000. I hope the uh, audio is okay. I know I'm going to have to change the field on my Yeti mic here. I know sometimes when I turn to my my uh, my whiteboard that I my volume goes down. So, all right. And how much stock? Uh, eight grand, right? So four grand in gas or eight thousand. Uh, it goes to far, uh, forty-four. Goes to forty-four. Uh, which of the following is true? Okay, so we're going to mark it at forty-four. So let's see if you can do that, and then we'll do it together. So you hit pause. I can't warn you this total overkill for test purposes. Okay, so now I'm gonna do a mark based on that, right? So welcome back, now we do a mark. They told me it went to 44, so that's my long mark of value. You still owe the broker term, you still owe the broker term And so now if we uh, subtract that, you have $8,000 in equity. Uh, let's see, so at all times you gotta have a 25% in equity. And so you're supposed to have 11 and you've only got eight. So be careful what you're being asked. The minimum maintenance on this account is 11, that's 25%. By the way, that 25% is very testable as a recognition test question and house requirements can always be more stringent, right? So be careful what you're being asked. That's the margin requirement. But of that $11,000 you already have in your account, you already have in your account, 8,000. And so you have a maintenance call of $3,000. Maintenance calls are due promptly. Now we'll never tell you what promptly is because we always say, sorry, that wasn't prompt enough. I'm just cleaning up my slide here a little bit. So $8,000 is what you have there. This was minimum maintenance. And so we're calling you for the difference. Cloud customer goes, oh yeah, maintenance call T plus two plus two. I go, no, no, what are you talking about? This is not a margin call. This is not a call for initial money. This is a you know maintenance call. Those are due promptly. Uh, you can either give me the cash, or you can uh, you know give me some additional collateral, or I'm going to liquidate you. So let's see. Uh, yeah, the client has a maintenance call of three. Remember this. This was the minimum maintenance. That's not the call. That's what he needs. No, he doesn't have a call of eight. That's what he's got. 
And so don't ever take warm, fuzzy bailout answers on the test. Like you can't figure it out or, you know, cannot be determined. That's never going to be the, uh, you know, right answer on your exam. Okay. Well, uh, I hope you found this uh, second explication helpful. Oh, I hit the wrong sound effect. That's, that's after you pass your test, right? And you get to go make some money. Uh, I'm joking. Here's the one I usually use. Okay, so uh, I will see you at some point on a future lecture. And uh, I hope you found the explanation helpful. And uh, I'll post this up to the uh, YouTube channel uh, probably today. <laughs>